Okay, folks, this will be the final video on Stefan Molyneux's The Future. That's right. The Future is a book written by Stefan Molyneux, who is an Irish-born Canadian anarcho-capitalist podcaster who promotes philosophy, non-aggressive parenting, stateless societies, and hard-boiled scientific empiricism. That is the Mycopedia entry because the Wikipedia entry is a straight-up hit piece. How to find Stefan Molyneux online? You can check out his website, freedomain.com, or his Rumble channel at Freedomain. And uh, he's also on BitChute. And there, he has a subscription service at Locals, uh, where you can pick up a copy of his book, The Future, which is, to him, what Atlas Shrugged is to Ayn Rand. It's supposed to be his magnum opus that, prevent, that presents his philosophy to the world. So here is our recap up through chapter 26. I will be kept covering uh, chapter 27 and some various uh, pieces for, of things that happened toward the end of the book today. Uh, and that'll be it. That will be the final thing. So here is the final recap of what happened so far. 95% of humanity has perished in a four centuries long war that ended when automated drones called angels put an end to violence. The survivors have since created a near-utopian society, commonly called the Civ, made possible by peaceful parenting in which parents raise kids without violence, uh, including yelling, spanking, timeouts, etc. Basically, all the parenting methods that we, that we use today are considered violence and child abuse. The Civ must decide how to deal with a survivalist society outside its borders that abuses its children by practicing the old, non-peaceful parenting that most of us had to suffer under. Since, if the abuse is allowed to continue, it could put humanity back on the path to self-annihilation. Basically, uh, humanity, having been parented in these horrible ways, turned into horrible people that uh, created... Societies that were horrible and then collapsed and then uh, eventually all went to war with each other and resulted in cataclysm. The survivalists reject integration with the Civ, so what do you do now? What exactly is the Civ going to do? Well, you turn them into pets, it turns out. <laughs> David, leader of one of the organizations that governs the Civ, proposes that some of the angels that saved mankind before be reactivated and introduced into the survivalist society, without their permission, of course, to evolve their culture by preventing all violence, especially violence against children. The angels are robots that look like cherubs, an appearance pleasing to children. The angels are equipped with sensors that can detect the threat of, this, of physical violence, the speech patterns of verbal abuse, and the results of any abuse including chemical signs of abuse such as increased cortisol levels or the presence of dried tears. The angels are programmed to prevent all non-consensual physical violence between adults, but they will not interfere with verbal abuse between adults because adults basically have the ability to walk away if they want. The angels will, however, prevent any and all physical and verbal abuse directed at children. The angels are super fast, can cut their way through walls so that there's no escaping their protective influences, and can deliver electric shocks up to lethal levels. David estimates it would take no more than two generations of the angels' influence, plus parenting guidance and education from civ volunteers, to train the survivalists in how to behave amongst themselves properly, adults and children alike. Now this kind of expounds on a interesting uh, an interesting theme on the relationship between virtue and happiness. The Roman, the survivalist leader, decries the removal of choice from his people. It is the ability to choose one's path that inculcates virtue. But David sees virtue as a means to an end. He says that virtue's only purpose is to accomplish happiness. So if taking bad parenting choices off the table increases happiness, well, then that accomplishes virtue's purpose just as well. So who cares whether virtue is diminished? You know, the, the point is to increase happiness. If virtue gets you there, fine. If complete control of your actions gets you there, just as fine. Now consider in contrast the promise of religion, because this is, I think, something that comes into play a lot when you're dealing with the ethics of, of this book, with the ethics of the other books that people have tended to read and invest their trust in. 
religion tends to say you need to practice virtue even at the cost of happiness and in a way that kind of makes sense because one of the things that happens when you practice virtue is that there are going to be people in the world who oppose you and strife is going to make you unhappy but that happiness is the cost or you know the loss of that happiness is the cost of your being virtuous but religion promises a reward as well there is this eternal happiness that is that is guaranteed to you if you practice virtue so if you practice virtue even at the cost of your happiness personal and even public happiness even if even if people don't generally like the rules that have been delivered you will get eternal happiness in another world not in this world so the religious ethic can say things like do unto others as you would have them do unto you and if someone strikes you on the cheek offer up your other cheek That's where the expression turn the other cheek comes from and that's basically saying you be good you know cor the corollary of that is that morality is an absolute you should strictly be moral without regard to anyone else's behavior it doesn't depend on the consequences of your actions you are supposed to do what's right no matter what and if evil is done to you on account of your virtue well you just take confidence that god will make it up to you in the afterlife the future's ethic on the other hand is much more malleable it's do unto others as they do unto you now you can start from the premise of you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you because you know you're basically being empathetic at that point and treating the other person as yourself but once they start showing you what their behavior is then you can start modifying your behavior so if someone strikes you on the cheek for example you're authorized to strike them on the cheek the corollary of this is that morality is not something fixed it's a relationship it depends on the person with whom you are engaging with so if that person is mistreating you then you are able to mistreat that person in turn as in defense it was probably more properly said so if evil is done to you on account of your virtue you can lower your standards you don't have to practice virtue uh, if it's going to put your life in danger and that's partly because in the future's ethic your life here is all that there is there's no afterlife coming for God to reward you however hey in this future man creates God for the win so you know it's all good right the angels are a constant inescapable presence within the survivalist tribe permitting no physical violence between adults and no verbal assaults or other adult misbehavior against children even abusive speech that a child might overhear is forbidden by the angels the angels also regulate relationships among children preventing their violence and abuse via verbal guidance and nonviolent restraint now this is preventing children from being abusive and the ways that the angels would do is like playing loud music to first them rather than subject them to electric shocks it's annoyance rather than you know actual harm so imagine God were present everywhere imagine you had angels all around you and they were basically preventing your every possible sin you were never going to be allowed to do what you want your your free will in a sense is gone because you no longer have choice now this is what Molyneux wants in a way he's on record as favoring unregulated unrestrained artificial intelligence systems that would deliver the unvarnished truth to mankind likening such a truth-bearing unbiased system to having God on earth very very impressive <laughs> to hear him talk about uh, AI in terms of it being God because you know if God is something that can't lie then if you actually program AI correctly and uh, just program it with the truth then you, know, you would actually get something that was telling you the truth all the time the, the way that God is supposed to do but uh, what do we know about AI today of course is that it, people have to program AI and that means people have control over what AI learns and what AI thinks and what AI gives credibility and what AI does not give credibility to so generally AI is an actual system that is very very much human driven and that's the kind of thing that kind of puts 
it makes it hard to believe that any kind of benevolent AI that would be so controlling is actually a good thing. However, it's important to understand that when Molyneux posits this world where AI-driven robots monitor and regulate human interactions until such monitoring and regulation is no longer needed because all learned how to behave, this story is not hyperbole. This story is not a cautionary tale. This is the world he actually wants, one where robots can intervene at any time to stop you from what they think is wrong, and you would have no recourse. It echoes to me of Marxism's dictatorship of the proletariat, this, this uh, living under robots. It strikes me as the idea that you know, for a while, society, because it doesn't know how to behave, because it doesn't understand what real morality is or what how people really ought to think and relate to one another, well, you just need to put some people in charge so that these people will be able to dictate uh, to everyone else, how it is that they are supposed to be, you know, and that, and they will, and you can, they will basically re-educate the people, and they will rewire the people into the kind of human beings that they always should have been, and therefore, they will create this better race of people who, you know, eventually, eventually, you can finally take the, uh, the enforcers away, and the people will just live as they should because they want to live as they should, and, and that's how they'll be, just by nature. <sighs> it's, like, it's like you start with totalitarianism to get to a point of freedom, except has that ever worked? And why do we think that would work in a world where AI is doing the totalitarianism? And would anybody really stand for that? That's the thing. It's like, I think everybody must, on some level, worry about the programming that's going into the AI and say, well, what if AI needs to be changed? Is there a way to change it? And you can say, you know, well, and the AI is going to be self-regulating and it can be self-correcting and it'll never have to uh, get input from any other outside source. And so you're basically throwing away any ability either for you or for future generations to modify or even improve on what the AI is doing. It's, it's one of these, these scary situations. And even though I know one of the things Molyneux talks about toward the beginning of the book, and we covered this some in one of my videos, I think it was on the chapter two of the book, <coughs> excuse me, that Molyneux looks at a lot of the science fiction of today as presenting technology in a negative light, saying that all that, te all that technology is going to do for us in the future is actually make our lives better. But when you look at this scenario, how many people are actually looking at this scenario thinking this is better? You know, one where there's a robot in every home telling you what to do at all times and shocking you into compliance if you don't obey it. Who, who are your overlords? You know, bow down before your robot overlords because they know what's best for you. Yeah, that's actually the theme, I think, in science fiction that we shy away from, that we look at as being utopia. And the idea that, oh, wait, no, real, you know, good totalitarianism has never been tried is the message that I feel like I'm getting from this book. You know, well, just like the liberals say, real communism has never been tried. If we were doing it, and if we had control over you, then you could trust that everything would go smoothly. Well, hey, if you would just trust Stefan Molyneux to program your AI, <laughs> then, 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 hey, you would, you would have robot overlords that were the best robot overlords that you could ask for. Oh, boy. Now, side note, we get, we get into the realm of mythology a little again, and it's downright insulting. The sentence, Roman sons were named Ain and Cable, literally translates to, the author is laughing at you now, so good luck taking the rest of the book seriously. Oh my gosh. In Genesis 4, 
it, it, this is for the, you know, if you have no experience with the Bible at all, you probably don't know the story of that. So let me just give you a quick summary. In Genesis 4, Cain and Abel are the first two sons of Adam and Eve, the original human couple who corrupted themselves, lost their innate perfection, and consequently were thrown out of paradise. The relationship between these first two children of humanity was so dysfunctional that one murders the other. Mankind plummets from perfection to murder in one generation. Molyneux, by naming the sons as such, spoonerizing their names, it seems, appears to be foreboasting here, not just forecasting, it just has it smacks of bragging, foreboasting here that the Civ's angels will take this tribe from abusers to perfection in one generation. So basically, it's like God created man, man fell, and then all of a sudden man created God, and God's going to, you know, this, this man created God is going to, this human created God, I should say, is going to take humanity to perfection. And, and the thing is, is that as with the future's prologue, when you introduce this mythical element, when you're clearly marketing back to mythology, it, it causes the reader to view the story as a plight of miraculous fancy rather than as a serious treatise on what kind of society humanity could actually produce. Now, here are some final dribs and drabs, because there's actually quite a bit more to the story. I think once I got done with this, I still had about 150 pages left to go, and I barreled through all of that. And here are just some of the high points that you might be interested to know. David's daughter, Alice, visits a... Now, Alice was the girl who was, uh, um, she was abused by some survivalist children, and uh, she then, after realizing, like, she's found her purpose... And she wants to um, help, uh, she wants to prosecute the abusers of children. David's daughter Alice visits a mentor who lectures her on oh I don't know a ton oh God that chapter those ch I don't know if it was one chapter or many, but that chapter was just like okay for some godforsaken reason he's had to set up a mentor named I don't remember his name and he's just blabbing on and on and on, and I'm like, is there a point to all this? And there, it just feels like there isn't. It's just blah, 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 blah. And that's one of the things that is one of the huge problems of this book, is that Molyneux never misses an opportunity to have his characters lecture one another at the expense of narrative progress. It's like, come on, we need something to happen. And then you feed in, you know, it, it, it reminds me of, there's a writer, Andrew Vax, who has also written extensively about abused children. And he has said very wisely it, that you cannot just soak the reader in your point of view and expect the reader to absorb it. Your point of view should be like the fat that you marble into a steak. The narrative of your story is the steak. But when you can at times, and in small measures, marble in some of the fat of your philosophy, that's when you have the proper balance. And you cannot just keep giving these philosophy dumps throughout your book. Because if nothing is happening, then all you're doing is going blah, 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 and the reader is wondering, well, what's going to happen next? What, where is this all leading to? Am I, is there going to be a payoff for all this? And oh my gosh, there's so much in this book that just doesn't feel like it pays off. And the book, consequently, because we lose that narrative flow again and again and again, the book just jogs in place. Now, we're interrupted a couple of more times by the musings of former U.S. President Louis Staten, freshly awakened from cryosleep, until he finally takes over the narrative altogether. And now... Here is the, one of the main problems of the book. The book really, really, really suffers because you have these two competing narratives going on. One of them present in the stream of consciousness interruptions that this Lewis Staten is delivering here and there. And then the other is the narrative of Alice going to the mountain, encountering the survivalists, suffering abuse at the hands of some survivalist children, and then returning to the sieve, where the sieve has to figure out what to do with the survivalists. That's one narrative. And then Staten has another narrative. 
In fact, his narrative is what's referenced in the original description of the book, which talks about a guy who wakes up and uh, in, in, into a world that is completely opposed to his philosophical views, and now he's going to be judged by it. That's basically the remainder of the book, is, is the result of his having been awakened, being introduced to this new world of the future, and realizing that he's going to have to stand trial for his prior misdeeds. And it, it's just like, that would have made probably a great second book, because you wouldn't be trying to switch back and forth between the two narratives. You wouldn't, part of, a lot of which was like autobiographical. I mean, if you could have, if he could have, uh, if, if Molyneux could have taken Staten's story and made it its own story and made that the future book two, you know, whereas Alice's story would have been the future book one, this would have gone over a whole lot better because you wouldn't have been shifting between two different kinds of books, mainly. And also so that the reader might be able to be introduced to more concepts through, I don't know, other kinds of action. I, I, I remember uh, putting forward some uh, ideas earlier on, but I'm just basically saying that this, this needed to be two books. And, and it's so obvious that it needed to be two books that it just felt like, you know, oh, I see how you're trying to weave things together, and it just falls flat. By the way, one of the things that I uh, talked about in an earlier uh, video was the absence of last names other than that of the state. Finally, toward the end of this, this uh, book, they make an appearance, uh, first on the person of Staten's lawyer. I don't know why. I guess it's just because, you know, Molyneux finally figured out, oh, you know, I really need to give these, these players last names now. And now... Now that this man, you know, Lewis Staten, whose actions led to the humanity decimating cataclysm is awake, he is to be tried by the Civ for an initially unspecified list of crimes. Well, last names are then attached to Alice. Alice gets the last name. Isn't that amazing? I mean, that was one of the things I was I was complaining about, is that David, Alice, and her mother Gretchen, Gretchen didn't even have a first name for most of the book, and then uh, uh, they never had a last name until now this portion of the book, and I don't think it's actually Alice's uh, uh, family last name that he, that she would share with David uh, Gretchen, so I, I'm, I'm still a, in a little bit in mystery as far as what his last name is, but uh, her name really means nothing. I mean, she just has to give one because she's, now, now last names are acceptable, but dear God, I mean, this, this is something that should have been done a long time ago. So the trial of Staten is metaphorically a trial of present-day society and its parental hypocrisies. You know, you, you just feel it flowing through the, the list of accusations running through this trial, and basically Staten trying to be the steel man who presents all of what society of today's excuses would be while have the prosecutor demolishing them and uh, and making making arguments against how you know our present day style of life is, but it's also an opportunity for Molyneux to vent his frustration at the persecution that he feels he suffered in trying to advocate positive change in the world. Laughably and seriously, I did laugh when this <laughs> happened. It is revealed that the reason Staten's son nearly destroyed the world. Now remember. Lewis Staten was president of the United States, and one of the things that we find about him is that his son, whom he parented and therefore is in some way responsible for creating, uh, his son nearly destroyed the world. And so you kind of think, well, what happened? You know, did did uh, did he become president after Staten became president? Did he uh, did he? become a military leader? I mean, was, was he a warlord? Was he, was he like in the United Nations or something and caused its collapse? I mean, what kind of, what kind of politician was this guy? Or was he, was he some sort of general? I mean, what, what was he? That's kind of left up to mystery and you don't really realize it's a mystery until this point, but it is revealed that the reason Staten's son nearly destroyed the world is that, drum roll please, Wait for it. No, seriously, you're going to love this. 
He owned a social media company that censored people like Molyneux. I shit you not. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if your head can get any more swollen than, than to think, if only they let me talk, I could have saved everything. Holy shit. Okay. Well, that is all that I have got for you <laughs> on this book. Ah. You know, the only thing that... I, I, I'm so glad to be done with this. What's really sad is I know he's got another book written. It's a, it's a prequel to this book called The Present, of course. The future, the prequel naturally is called The Present. And I believe The Present is uh, going to show how it is that society stumbles its way into the cataclysms that were responsible for nearly destroying the human race. And, God, I'm just not looking forward to it. And, and the sad thing about this is, is that Molyneux was a good writer. He was, and, and there are good elements to this kind of stuff here. I mean, you know, despite my laughing, I mean, the social media bit revelation was kind of, kind of, it was kind of a nice twist. But, um, Lord. Yeah, I, 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 I've I read some of his older works, or at least I've listened to some of his older stuff on audiobook, and it just it's just kind of amazing that he was able to produce such good material in the past and then completely drop the ball with what is supposed to be this book, his magnum opus. This is, I, I mean, unless that magnum is for shooting yourself in the head, I don't know what kind of magnum opus it's supposed to be. This ain't it, fam. Um, I mean, for for a much better book, you would probably be better off reading Almost, uh, which, by the way, if you ever have a chance to, to listen to that as an audiobook, which he himself performs, that was a really good read. Um, I tried listening to The God of Atheists, but he has a problem in that book that is not quite as pronounced as it is in the future. Uh, which is, he will have chapters that are absolutely dedicated to just philosophizing and, and talking about certain types of people and how they interact and react and things like that. It's a lot of philosophical and psychological profiling that he does that, uh, unfortunately drags the book down to snail's pace. Uh, I actually had to skip a lot of uh, sections on that. And there is another section about a boy band that I really didn't understand to listen to it um so there there's 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 good stuff in that book the god of atheists and almost i think that's probably his literary triumph it's not this book damn sure it's not this book uh i would definitely look to almost as being his best work in that area um there's another book of his that I'm planning on reading, and I just haven't gotten around to it yet, so hopefully he will hear me. Uh, okay, so that's about it. I'm done. I'm done with this book. This is the end of the playlist. This is We are we are completely freaking done with this. I mean, the only way this playlist is going to get extended is if I decide to review his book, The Present, and pack that on to the end of this playlist and make it kind of a, a joint playlist between the two. But otherwise... We're done. You are free to go. I'm Mike Partika. Thank you so much for watching. Please do subscribe. Get a chance. Uh, things are coming to a head over for the Ripiverse. Uh, please do watch my latest video on that. And um, get back into the comic book review section uh, in hopefully very, very, very soon. Uh, once again, I'm Mike Partika. Do subscribe, and I will talk to you later.